Joanne Baumgartner, and I am in the studio workshop of Chicago composer William Russo. Bill has been involved in jazz as a musician since the 1940s. He's taught composition, orchestration, arranging, theory, and improvisation in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and in Europe. In the early 1950s, Russo was with Stan Canton's orchestra, for which he wrote much of Canton's most ambitious music. He's written film scores and music for the theater, rock and tatas, concertos, ballets, and operas. His symphony number no. two was commissioned and performed by Leonard Bernstein. I'll be talking to Bill about those early years and learning what his current projects are in a visit with an American composer. Bill, let's start with your early influences. Your mother was an artist who also played the piano, and your father was a lawyer who played the saxophone and clarinet. Did they influence or approve your choice of a musical career? They didn't actually. They, they thought that going into music, especially the kind of music that I was interested in, was a, a step backwards because my father and his eight brothers had all been musicians and their father was a violinist who worked his way from France to America in 1870, I think. So for them, it represented a turn away from college education and art, uh, cultured, assimilated American life. When did you decide then to go into music? Uh, was it sometime after that? No, I think I was four years old. My uncle Danny was the conductor of the pit orchestra at the Palace Theater. And I used to go there with my dad. And uh, it was so exciting. I knew, it was, I, I knew that was it for my five, six, seven, I don't know what age. But somewhere along the line, I just knew that music did something for me, to me, with me, that nothing else in life did. And, uh, of course, I might have been encouraged by the fact that my parents weren't exactly excited about <laughs> what I was doing. How did they feel then when you when you began studying with Lenny Tristano, or I think you also studied with Dr. John Becker, a colleague of uh, Charles Ives and uh, Jariah Yira? Uh, how did they feel about those? Uh, well, the, in the early days, because I was going in jazz, and uh, jazz meant playing in joints and strip clubs and nightclubs and smoky, murky, demi uh places, they were very upset because they thought that I was throwing my life away. And to them, any form of popular music meant uh, degradation. Uh, the possibilities of jazz as an art or of any music in the vernacular as an art wasn't available to most of us at that time, but probably not exactly to me either. So they thought that it was downhill, and they were upset. Then, and later when I wrote for Sam Kenton's band, and after that studied with Dr. Yirak and Dr. Becker, um, they thought a little better of it. They thought, first of all, that I might be able to make a living, which is not an inconsequential aspect of life. Of course. And they thought that I was writing some things that had merit, that they weren't just trashy stuff. Uh, you're responsible, you mentioned Kenton, uh, for some of Stan Kenton's most memorable and experimental works. Uh, what kind of music were you writing then for him, and, and what are your memories from those Kenton years? Well, the first day that I joined the band was the large orchestra, the Innovations in Modern Music Orchestra, and I joined the same day that several other people joined, including Maynard Ferguson. He and I were exactly the same age, 21, and we shared a room at the Vine Lodge in Motel in, in L.A. and then the orchestra rehearsed to the theater down the street and it was an extraordinary experience to hear all those strings and those virtuoso players and I had written a piece that a little while earlier actually that I orchestrated for Kenton and they performed the piece and it was, a, it was probably the most exciting moment in my life other than later playing of my second symphony by the New York Philharmonic. In the 50s, Kenton Band, you worked with composers such as Shorty Rogers, Pete Rugolo, Shelley Mann, and Jimmy Jufri. What was it that set Bill Russo apart from them? Was it your discipline, your technique, your form? Yeah, yes. I, I suppose we were all considered primitives because almost all of us, even Rugolo, who had the most education in music, um, didn't have a an ordinary sort of music background. The difference between me and the others, not so much Rugolo, 
was that I was a Tristanoite, that I had studied with Lenny Tristano, and I believed in this long line, this, this Bach-like improvised line being applied to the orchestra. And I didn't, I wasn't interested, I mean, I've always loved Count Basie, but I didn't want to write Count Basie type pieces, and that was the prevailing mode among, oh, even Jufri, although his name probably shouldn't be in there, certainly with Holman and Mulligan and Shorty Rogers. And the orchestra enjoyed playing Basie orientated pieces, so they were more pleasant to play, and probably didn't like my pieces as much, nor did they like Rugolo's pieces as much. Ironically, they sounded better playing our pieces than they did playing what made them happier, which... You've worked hard to make your music more accessible to wide layers of society rather than just privileged audiences. One example I'm thinking about was the performance of your opera, John Hooten, at Crane Tech High School in Chicago. How was that music received? It was received very enthusiastically. They were wonderful. They were wonderful as an audience. They were mostly African-American high school students, and they were noisy, which didn't mean that they didn't like it, because they did like it a lot. I think that one can work with young students, underprivileged students, people who haven't heard classical music or music that's meant to be listened to, and get them to hear, you know, teach them to listen, give, uh, explain that they can hear a string quartet and really concentrate absolutely quietly, but that's another story. Anyway, it was a wonderful audience, and the part of Othello was played by one of their former teachers. They were delighted beyond belief to see that. You once said that the orchestra is a school for listeners, that it teaches a new way of jazz. A former student of yours remembers a course you taught called Understanding Jazz in which you had your class listen to two sides of Count Basie and his band play opposite each other, questioning and answering. Do you think this art of listening is as vibrant and alive today as it was then? I don't think people listen as carefully now, partly because they hear so much music. We hear so much music in elevators and in theaters and in classrooms all over the place. Music is used as background, which means that we're less sensitive. We're, we're not hearing as well as we could or we should. And it's too bad because listening attentively and carefully is a great gift. Bill, you wrote the liner notes on many of your early albums. Uh, I had before me The World of Alcina, one of your early albums. And I'd like to read from it. The beginning of this dance is the same ensemble chord which ended the third dance. As a piece of metal only slightly slanted will gleam in the sunlight, this chord is transformed by the addition of a shake played by the brass. I notice that you help your listeners to really listen carefully and precisely to what you wrote. Who do you write for? Who is your audience? Well, I try to write for people who are listening carefully, and I do try to help them in a number of ways, distinctly non-20th century ways, for example, in older music. The beginning of each important segment was announced by a loud chord. It's true of Mozart, for example, and Haydn, and even Beethoven. And I do things like that. Also, I try to make my orchestration, that is, what instrument plays with what melody correspond, rather than work against each other. In other words, I'm not so interested in asymmetry, which is the goddess of our century. I'm interested in symmetry, and it's interesting, and I think it helps people to hear. So I write for people who are uh, not particularly trained in music, but who are willing to sit down and listen to a piece carefully. I don't write for my colleagues. I try to please the players in the orchestra, because that means you get better performances, and also if you're pleasing them, it means that you're probably on the right track, but I'd never write for other composers, and I certainly don't write for people in the academic world. Bill, you once wrote that, and I'd like to quote you. Our music is American, but in a different way than most jazz today. The America of Melville, Emerson, and Thoreau is better and stronger than the America of Norman Mailer and Tennessee Williams. This is the mainstream which attracts me, an America which is fresh and new, vital and curious. Do you believe that as strongly today as when you wrote it? I might use different names, but I do believe it strongly. I think there is a real quality of America. Duke Ellington is an example, I think, of an America that's larger than much jazz, which centralizes or used to concern itself 
excessively with the psychology, sexuality, drugs, and so on and so forth. Yes, I think that, Amer that Emerson's America and Ellington's America is my America also. Which writers and musicians, uh, besides Ellington, which you've mentioned, interest you today? Well, it's a great shock to be saying this, but I suppose Verdi is the most interest is the composer who interests me, excites me more than any other. I mean, I still love, I still love Mozart and Bach, good Lord, um, and Beethoven. But uh, Verdi emerges more and more as strong and interesting and clear and direct and honest and gorgeous. Bill, your Titan Symphony No. 2 was performed by Bernstein and Carnegie Hall several times. Subsequently, it was given the Kusevitsky Grant. You've known Bernstein for many years. What was it like working with him? Well, he was wonderful. He, he, uh, he commissioned, or caused to be commissioned, several works in that season, the 1959-1960 season. And... He performed them brilliantly, and he performed, he was an extraordinary conductor, an extraordinary musician, and a generous, open, large-minded person. It was, a, it was a great gift. Seiji Ozawa was the musical conductor of the San Francisco Symphony when he recorded your three pieces for blues band and orchestra featuring the Corky Siegel Jim Schwa band. Both get cheers whenever they're performed. Does it give you great satisfaction to have such a claim for su such diverse pieces? Do you mean because those pieces are blues symphonics? Yes, that was very exciting. I, I, I resisted writing the first piece, three pieces, and I finally did it. And it is often the case, the piece that you resist the most, the piece you have the most trouble with, the piece that you think you'll never finish, turns out to be not so bad after all. Seiji Ozawa was with San Francisco for a long time. Now he's with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He has played that piece all, all over. He played the three pieces, rather. He played with the Chicago Symphony and with the New York Philharmonic and with the Boston Symphony. Are there any other plans to work with him again? I hope so. Um, your work is often sensual, passionate, lyrical. How would you describe the way you approach a composition? I do a lot of pre-thinking, and I used to think that was just a 20th century phenomenon, that we had to decide how to write a piece in advance of writing the piece, and we couldn't carry over what we knew from one piece to another. But then reading Samuel Johnson recently, I, I realized that's not exactly true, that a lot of work goes into the preliminary stages, irrespective of the style or the season or the century. Bill, has the development of synthesizers and computers affected the way you write? The best way to use a computer for me is to edit, to change around, to alter, to get an idea about something being in a different key or used differently, and then to be able to see it, not exactly instantly, because I can't read the screen, as well as many people, I need to have the printout, and my printout is slow, but nonetheless, it's a lot faster than actually writing out all those notes. So I can print out an entirely different version and then have a, a chance to look at it in a way that I wasn't able to before. It is an interesting medium. It's been said that opera is the ultimate challenge and achievement in a composer's life because it combines all the other arts. Do you agree with that? Well, I do. I, I suppose I've become an opera composer. I'm not sure that's the reason that I did it. I, I just love sung words more than anything that I can think of, and the idea of being able to tell a story, to have a singer actually tell what's going on, not have to depict it solely through the somewhat abstract qualities of music is very exciting to me, because I have this teacher storytelling trait in me. But I love the sound of the voice. I adore the sound of the voice. I never thought I would as a young person like most jazz musicians. I hated all singers, even jazz singers. Maybe Billie Holiday was an Thanks. exception. But otherwise, I didn't like it. I just thought it was uh, people getting all the attention and we were doing all the work, which is a silly parochial point of view, but most instrumentalists have it. How long does it take you to write an opera? 
Well, the last big opera that I, the grand opera that I did, the biggest opera, took at least two years. It's not quite finished. I, I, I still haven't executed the orchestration.